episode of the Women's Hurling Podcast, episode three. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, remember to uh, like and subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button and subscribe and give us a follow. Uh, David Reedy is joining me again. Davy, with all the announcements lately, you're obviously busy getting ready to go back training now at this stage. That's the thing now, uh, Adrian. We kind of took the last three or four weeks off completely. Um, I did very little. So it's, again, it's just these next two or three weeks, it's kind of build up kind of individual running, get that kind of make sure you're ready to train once we get back into the club uh, club action. So that's where we're at at the moment. Yeah, busy time for you. So you'll be blowing, blowing out your arse for a couple of sessions, no doubt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, this week we're back in the sunny southeast. Uh, we're in Waterford. So we have Beck Carton, Waterford's first all-star. She added a second one last year. And Don O'Rourke, who I suppose is credited with... Uh, we're bringing Waterford to the next level um, at Senior Camogie, so we won't mess around. We get him in. Bring him straight in, Sully. Let's go. Okay, so we are joined by uh, Beck Carton, two-time All-Star, two-time Waterford GA Personality of the Year, four Ashburn Cups, and I hate to break it to Davy, but probably the best player I've ever coached, so unlucky. <laughs> and we have Don Lorork with us as well, the man who is widely credited with uh, taking Waterford to the next level and making them so competitive. At senior level, guys, you're very, very welcome. Thanks for joining us. I, I suppose we, before we get started, so we, like we were kind of talking um, off, offline, and we were just kind of talking about the landscape of, of Camogie at the moment and, and mm. what's going to come first. Is it going to be club championship or a county championship? Um, we are kind of adamant that counties should come back first. Yeah, I think so. It's uh, because I suppose we're recording this a week in advance, so hopefully, maybe we'll know a little bit more by the time this comes out. But um, yeah, there's just a bit of uncertainty there, I suppose, and we're just say, talking offline, we're both involved in hurling and camogie, and I suppose the last couple of weeks have been hard planning for the hurling season, uh, because we have the dates, we know what we're aiming at, and it's reasonably clear, albeit a bit of uncertainty around the county player involvement and stuff like that, but the camogie is just up in the air, and um, like there's talk of club starting first, and then county playing, and then going back to the club again for provincial and, and our hurling club, and it just seems well over the place. It just seems like there's a huge opportunity staring them in the face commercially from a media point of view of being able to run off the, the Intercounty Championship in August and the start of September with no competition from the GA. So like you'd always hear Camogie complain about being playing second fiddle to the GA. Why not take the opportunity of being handed on a plate now and give more exposure to the sponsors and get more media time and stuff like that? Um, I suppose from a sports science point of view or a player welfare point of view. Like surely it would be safer to have our elite players going back into the county setups, the likes of what Waterford have, the likes of what Cork, Galway, Kilkenny have, and no offence, but like outside the top seven or eight club teams in the country, the level of expertise in S and C and stuff like that wouldn't be wouldn't really be up to scratch. So there's a huge risk there. Then the back to the clubs first. Of course the counties, the likes of Donald here would have been pulling out of them. Of course they'd have been back training, they'd have been playing club and county at the same time, they'd have been off for two or three months. So look. It just seems like a no-brainer, that stupid word, but it seems like a no-brainer to let the county go back first and finish up around the middle of September and let the clubs play away then into October, November, same as normal. But I suppose we just have to wait wait and see what the story is. Big time, big time. So what do, what do you think, guys? What do you think, Beth, as a player? No putting you on the spot. <laughs> what, what, would be the, what would be the best, I suppose, for, for you to last the season without getting injured? What would you like to see happen, I suppose? Um, I suppose at the moment it's just I'm not too picky at the moment just to get back playing or even have any dates would be massive I suppose um, we're training away at the moment with absolutely nothing so to get any dates would be um, I know obviously as you said the lads here are going club first um, and um, and I suppose as you said there like it is going to be you can't see uh, I think Liam Carroll came out with an article there during the week that is saying basically be naive if if you think intercounty managers won't be pulling out of them as well, I suppose that it's a way like it, it, it can't, I suppose, just be seen in September and, and club, what club needs to take priority to. So once the Camogie come out and set something, we can see where we go. But um, I'd be happy either way once we, we have something going. Mm -hmm. I suppose Liam Cahill got a bit of flack there in, during the week, didn't he, for saying that. But look, he's just being honest. I suppose, Dave, you're in the same situation as Beth there. You'd be tipping back with Aerobe now shortly. Like, is it realistic to think that you won't see a clear training session until Aerobe rolls the club? But that's one thing, like like Bet said, that we have dates. So we have dates set for club. Um, and again, we're still waiting and see what way the structure is going to be around club championship. But it's going to be a matter of 
seeing if we're still in club championship, we're going to be training Tuesday and a Friday and then a game on a Sunday. And then the question will come in, the later it goes, will Clare, will the Corks, will the, the Kilkenny's, all these teams, Tips, Limericks, will they be expecting to do a Wednesday session before Sunday, before Sunday club championship? And the one, the one kind of group of people that I'd be kind of sorry for looking out for would be the kind of younger members of the panel. So the, the first or second year on the, on the county panel, like, again, you can cast your mind back to when I was on the county panel. My first and second year, all you want to do was get onto the Clare team, kind of be a regular starter, um, and you do anything to, to be that. But, like, I've been on five or six years now, have that kind of maturity and respect the club enough to know I'll be training Tuesday and Friday and then um, playing that club championship on a Sunday. Um, and it's going to be a difficult situation. And the one thing, again, as I say, is I hope players aren't put into them situations that the hierarchy in the GA and the, uh, the GPA, WGPA will, will step in and force down something. But we all know how hard that is for, for, for them as well. Yeah, it's like, yeah, <laughs> everyone's kind of cutting the bollocks off the club man or the county managers at the moment. But like the same lads have given out about it on Twitter. If David Reedy and performing up in Croke Park, he'd be cutting the bollocks off you as well. So <laughs> they want to have it both ways, really, don't they? Like, but, uh, I suppose Wexford have probably done the right thing. Davies always a step ahead, but really like the, the Wexford County Finals in Pennsylvania for the twenty third of August, They're running off in twenty one days, and, and people giving out about it. But look, the club players know exactly what they have to do. They'll get a month. They'll have a run at it. The county players will go in. I don't know what Donald, you've, you've moved over now to the Hurdle World again and you're down with Aaron's Oak, a famous club in, or Aaron's own famous club in, uh, in Cork. Like, what are your thoughts? I know there's no competition structure and stuff like that, but realistically, do you expect to have full access to the likes of Robbie and the lads for, for the duration of the club window, or is that unrealistic as that? No, I, I couldn't see it myself personally, Adrian. I think that um, Robbie and, uh, say, we've called in on the Cork under 20 squad. Um, there's no doubt about it that they'll be with the Cork and I, I personally wouldn't have a problem with that they're trained at a much higher level uh, they're, they're, they're in a, an environment plus that they're going to be with lads for 10, 11 months of the year anyway you know so and if we're leaving them back to the clubs you know fair enough brilliant I'd love to have them there but we certainly wouldn't be throwing the ties out of the ground it's like it doesn't make sense to me and if I, I'm there training the club team that have we're, you know, we're trying to do our best to win the championship in Cork this year. But like, I wouldn't want players come and train in the club when they could be training with top class players the whole time. It's only going to bring their game on. And when they come back into the setup, then they're going to be absolutely flying. So that's, that's, I personally wouldn't have a problem with it. But it's easy for us to say that. It might be different for a club team that maybe have five or six lads on a, on a, on a county panel. You know, it might be that little bit difficult for them. I think as Beth says there, it's, we're all delighted just to get something in place, no matter what it is. And I think for every day, person in the country, uh, be it whatever level you're at, is just to be able to go back out onto your pitch on a Tuesday or Thursday night, be a county or club, whatever it may be, just get out playing games. Even if there wasn't a championship this year, I don't know, they're still, it's still up in the air. We haven't any direct confirmation from headquarters as to what's going on. So I don't know what's planned. Like you, you heard there during the week that the leagues aren't out, the leagues that they haven't. Um, Move them out yet, so there's a lot of big games to be played before championship comes in. But from what we're getting is that Kieran Kingston, the Cork senior hurling manager, is uh, he's hoping that the structures that are in place in Cork this year, where there's a group of four teams per group, three games, he's hoping that they, they remain the same because players will get championship game time then. So, but I'd be, I'd be saying that Cork will probably be pulling their players, and I personally wouldn't have any problem with that. No, I suppose because cl as club coaches were kind of used to it in the two years as Richie Davy, like I suppose we just got used to operating around yourself and sods, and I suppose we had a good few lads with the football as well, Fitzy and Russell and them boys as well. And like if anything, when you came back into it, I suppose it, it lifted the whole thing because like I suppose the lads to be there all the time were kind of maybe throwing the shoulders back saying, Listen, we have a point to prove these boys aren't going to walk in. And I suppose you kind of felt maybe the responsibility that having been away from the setup for so long that you kind of felt as the county players to drive it on. So I think invariably you nearly always got a lift out of it, like so. But that's one thing that I would ask on is it's all well and good to go, like the county lads will go off and with the fact that it's such a small window before your club championship starts, 
like I can only presume tactics have to be kind of surrounding the likes of Robbie. Um, like, and that's, that's going to be in every club team that your, your county players, the majority of the time, your tactics kind of revolve around them. But they need a certain amount of time within, within your setup, I presume, to get, to get used to them tactics, to get used to, to playing with the lads again. Because um, it's only a short window. Yeah. No, no, you're dead right, I suppose. Um, David, what we've done with since the challenge getting over the and but what we done after the lockdown was there. So we say with Robbie, for example, um, he's on the Cork band, so he's playing, he's going to go for Cork. But he's actually missing the first round of the championship game because he was suspended. He was suspended, but after the incident since Galway. But Robbie would be playing exactly the same position for us at Aaron's own. You know, he'd be playing that wing forward position. But what we've done, we say... Or saw your tennis. Yeah, I was just about to say, the, <laughs> the, the, mind, game, the mind games have started already. <laughs> 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 There's no two ways about it. There's no way you're giving away this on, on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but look, what we've done is sports. In the lot, as, uh, as you said, their tactics. We took it as an opportunity to uh, right. We didn't put our our feet up in the sofa. We said, right, we want to kick on, and we wanted to get. Uh, we wanted. We said the top clubs in Munster, Gunnar Barcelli last season, Bally Gunnar probably the benchmark, but Pierce and Glimmerick, um, Air Rogan, Clare, you know. So uh, they're the they're the main teams. We were saying. So what we what we said was that we go through a lot of tactics and we go through a lot of stuff. Uh, during lockdown. So we went through a lot of different scenarios and games and we went through puck of routines and things like that. So, uh, Robbie will be, and our Park 20 players will be well aware of what we're doing as we've gone through that. So all we'll have to do coming up to the night of the championship is maybe just 20, 25 minutes at the end just to walk through what we went through over already. They're well tuned into it. So we've, we've, we use that time to, to get through a lot of stuff to be honest with you. Is that 33 to 1 isn't looking too bad at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> He's straight on. You stop a train, so you don't put any money on him. <laughs> right. yeah, but again, that's, that's smart using time wisely. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can't, can't, can't argue with that. Um, well, I suppose we kind of start talking about more about Watford and Watford Camogie um, base, but I try and cast your mind back to 2011. I know it's probably a long time ago now. Um, but what for Camogie we were, were playing junior and you were kind of starting to make uh, underage county panels. What was the kind of mindset like? Was the goal always to, to get to the for the junior Camogie team or what was the mindset like with you personally? Yeah, um, I suppose the father would have brought me to a lot of the games, um, even when they were junior and, and when they got up intermediate, I was out of myself. And um, I suppose it's always to make to, to make that breakthrough. But at, at that age, you're just concentrating on, I suppose you're really enjoying the game and, and you're looking up to, to girls like you have Trish Jackman was there, Jenny Simpson, all them. You know, they lost a few of the, the junior finals there in a row on that and, and they eventually made push through. But um, yeah, definitely... I suppose it's always in the back of the mind to play, but at that age, you're definitely looking at enjoying it and, and trying to progress with both your club and, and great through on to those county panels underage, those academies there at that stage and they started to come on and that, that was definitely a big tur- turning point, I think anyway, with, with what the community was the setup of the underage structure became much better and the academies set in and you actually had the likes there, so Jacob and Helena and that coaching on those academies. So definitely um, it started to progress and then I suppose as that happens, you you definitely get in the more mind frame of, of trying to progress onto that team. And yeah, as you said, the underage structures are improving. Like you picked up a few, was you in a couple of under 16B and minor B and, and titles. So obviously the work was starting to, to show, show a little bit. But in 2015, you competed in the A championship in the minor for the first time. Like for you personally, how important do you think that was for your own development as a player to be playing at that level? Well, definitely massive. I, I actually think minor could be minor A along with, with the Ashburn could be the next best thing to the senior. Sometimes you're playing at that top level and, and the pace is like you go from playing B to A and, and you feel it straight away. It probably took us nearly definitely I played that full year and I think we I won one game in two years playing A with Washford. We bet we actually bet Galway my last year um, and they went on to bring Tip to a replay. 
So it was it was hard work. It certainly wasn't easy, and there was a lot of hard work put in. But but there was no point where after winning the B, and it was time to get up and and time to start progressing. And if you want to play at that senior level and and that intermediate level, you need to be playing at at the A levels. And thankfully, we still are at the moment, and I'm trying to keep progressing. Yeah, because we had, we had Sheila Moynihan and Fiona Hickey on last week just talking about Limerick and I suppose a major red flag and a major worry for Limerick Camogie at the moment is that they're going back competing at B and under 16 and minor and just seems to be a focus on, on winning underage B trophies whereas like you said, it takes a couple of years to adapt to and like I do remember what for taking a couple of just some trimmings although we were blessed to beat you I think one year below Carrigan or I can't remember what year it was, maybe 2015 but like you do need to be playing at A level to develop A players. If you play at B level, you develop B players. Like you know, and that's it's it's as simple as that. So that was a big move for uh, a big move for Waterford, and it's obviously starting to pay off. Yeah, definitely. We was actually really looking forward to watching the under sixteen this year. They won the B last year, um, and we're up A, and obviously with everything that's happening at the moment, but there's a serious crop. I think anyway coming through there, and and they need to get up A, like they won the B last year and it was, it was time to come up and hopefully it can be two years at minor A as well before progressing on. Big time, yeah. Donald, um, like I suppose back then, like Watford started competing very strongly. As Beth said, uh, they were competing in minor A. They, they were, I think they won a uh, Munster title as well. St. Angeles in the city um, won, won a senior A uh, title as well. Um, club was very strong outside of the county as well then. But was that something that attracted you to the, the senior job that these kind of flow of young players coming through? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was David, as most you know, it was <clears throat> firstly it was when you get asked to do anything for a county, it's a massive honour. So that was the first thing I took on board was that look, Dini, I was chuffed to be honest with you, to be asked to do something. And we say I would have been just to walk from the rage under sixteen for one year in the hurling. And we were over the second team. We managed to win the All Ireland with that. But I didn't. I I I envisaged going back into Waterford underage, and I do in the future. Please God. But to be asked to do something for your county was massive. Um, initially, I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. When I was first asked, I said no. I don't think I will. Um, but as you said there about the talent that was coming through, I didn't. I went away. I took time to think on it and. You know, I looked at the amount of talent that was coming through and I knew what was there. You know, I knew what was there, that there was there was a good three or four girls that I would have been very familiar with from my own club and Beth was a, a household name within the county even at a very young age, you know. So there was a there was a lot of talent there and I think Beth he lost to Cork in a in a minor final, I think, one year, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, in an under sixteen B final. Under sixteen B final, yeah. Yeah. And, and I knew one of the lads that was over that Cork team and I spoke to him about me he, he couldn't get over about the, there was a lot of players coming through in Waterford so that that, in, that initially attracted me to it uh, David but like there were so much we we'll say girls in and around Bet's age that there was so much untapped potential there and as you said the Ursuline College were, were starting to catch birds you know they were they were flying and I said Jeannie John, you know, we'll give it a go we'll give it a go especially when there's so much untapped potential there and you know, it, was, it was brilliant. I enjoyed it there so much for the two years. So you rocked in, said Beth is a household name, and one of the first things you did was stop her taking freeze off her left and switch her over <laughs> onto her right. <laughs> yeah. Two things, you obviously have supreme confidence in yourself as a coach to go do it. And how exactly did that conversation go down? And did you have to ask Joey's permission first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joey, it was, it was actually funny for me. I always believe that... Um, a right-handed free taker is, you know, there's, there's less margin for error when they're throwing up the ball and we say the downtime come down. Whereas, like, if you look at, okay, Mara Shannon's a left-handed free taker, Paul Codd of you know, there is some unbelievable left-handed free taker. Uh, uh, we got to see Carrie Dole, left-handed free taker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but look, I suppose, Adrian, probably the main thing there, if you look at Bess, I knew she was so natural off both sides. So like I can't imagine we say we say you're looking at the top free takers in the country to minister, you're Patrick Corbins, um, Aaron Galland, he throws him up off the left. He's very inconsistent. He's when he's good, he's very good, but he does tendency to miss him. But like oh, Davey loves that comment. Look, he loves the old dig at Limerick. He just can't <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even cheeky green. Look at it. <laughs> Tony, Tony Kelly's Tony Kelly's been taking freeze off his left hand side. 
he wouldn't be consistently brilliant. So I always maintain that the right hand is just the way that they toss the ball. But like, I can't imagine, we'll say, well, maybe I wouldn't say put Patrick Horgan in this bracket or TJ Reid off the other side so quickly. And that can just tell you the amount of natural talent that they'd have off both her left and right. And, you know, it's Ronnie Sullivan can do it in snooker, he can switch, <laughs> you know, and Beth had that ability. So I was very confident. And plus, she wouldn't go well on her left at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for that. <laughs> I think. Brilliant. <laughs> so she, she practiced so much, you know, and we, we, maybe we maybe went a little bit OTT over it. We put so much effort into it, and no, no more so than Beth. And, like, just tell you, I suppose, Beth, how committed she is that she, stuck at them free so much. You know, we went up nights before training and it was like an hour before training and we'd video record her and we'd get it down to the, t- t- time it down as best we could and get it, try and get it to a great art. And I remember one night I said to Beth when we were going away, she was very, very comfortable um, at him. And you know, it was at the start we didn't want her hitting him from, we just wanted to get her comfortable in around 21, 30 years old, slowly build it up. I remember just saying to Beth, um, you know, there's going to have to be nights now, Beth, when it's absolutely lashing rain. You get up your bag of sitters, go out and hit the freeze in wet conditions. And like, I remember I've been at home and it was, it was a Wednesday night, I think we weren't training, and it was absolutely lashing outside. And next thing I get a text from Beth to say Dawn was up in the field tonight, took the freeze during the rain, you know, and she's like, it's just she was so committed. Like, she was willing to do, to put in the hard yards and, no, I suppose it's hopefully you enough for anyone. You didn't go up with her and that way, like. You were just happy with the tips. We're in Munich, we're playing Man City in the Champions League. The same thing you, it's not. Sorry, <laughs> Rosanne. Yeah. But, but Beth, like, when a, a coach or a manager comes and tells you that you're switching si- that he wants you to switch sides, you're being taken freeze off your left the whole way up. Like, how would you react to that? Do you resist? Because, like, again, I, I'm a free tech as well, but if I got told to switch sides, um, they'd have to, like, it'd be in the back of my mind, like, just psych- psycholo- or psy- psychological. <laughs> like, it has to, has to be in the back of your mind um, what's going on here in, in a way. But how do you react to that? Yeah, I suppose Don Don will tell you himself. There, he's probably a bit a bit resistant at the start, like, because I didn't feel as comfortable off my right, and um, just naturally would have been naturally left. But then, as he said, it was in the mind a bit, and I just went up and started hitting them slowly off the right. And it didn't. It took a few weeks to even, I suppose, to even proper think about changing them. And then once you make that decision, you have to go with it. There's no. I haven't hit a free off my left since I've done it because there's no turning back now just had to make that decision and absolutely go with it and and that's what happened but no definitely there was a, there was I think I tried him in a challenge game first we played Dublin and um definitely after that I was like he's no this this can't happen but um no look as you said it was in the mind and just absolutely went with it and and just stayed going so from from the point that he told you to come up and hit them off your right mm. from then on did you not hit a free again off your left no I haven't hit a free off my left since then just penalties <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I did a penalty off my left, all right, but no, I haven't had a free because I'd be too. I'm just sticking with the right now, and I, there's still a lot of work being done on them at the moment. Like they're they're still not yeah. there yet, like, but um, they're they're getting there. Yeah, it's a serious it's a serious move to make. It's like so in a couple of years ago, we did a bit of work, Davey, just on pre, just getting your routine right and stuff like that. And same as what you're talking about, no, 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 just video on it and technique and stuff, but. Geez, I don't know, like, that's probably three or four years ago. I don't know what I've had the confidence in myself as a coach to even suggest the switch. Um, I'm not sure how you reacted either, Dave. You look like you're hitting a few of them off your left a lot of the time. But... <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should have made the switch. But... Maybe, maybe yeah. you should have told me so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably, probably missed out. Yeah, but... <laughs> but, you know, it's easy, like, easy to say no. It's easy to, easy to give over but that thing, and as well and you're standing on the sideline watching them with no pressure on you, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of but funny like, there, um, so you said that you had to get the permission off Joey too. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. It was a night and Joey, Joey ran me up and the wind in Grace too, um, Dennis Al's home pitch, the wind up there is always, always pretty yeah. wind up there. Yeah. And, uh, it's up in the highest point of all from sitting there. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
me on the phone and I couldn't really understand Joey, what he was saying. And next thing he goes, geez, I think you're onto something here, he goes. We just practiced there on the road. You could be right, he goes, like that. <laughs> and that was it, that was two thumbs <laughs> up, <I guess>. <laughs> <laughs> You know Joey fairly well too, so it's funny. Uh, yeah, I've across him a few times, I actually remember. Uh, it's funny you talk. I actually remember now that you say it. Well, I used to work for Liberty A, so I suppose Joey would have been the next level up. So I didn't try to kind of know him, but I do remember uh, uh, we played in the minor championship in 2015, and we'd won the All Ireland the year before. But obviously, look, minor is different. So we had a different team, but we were absolutely blessed. I think uh, I know that we hit six or seven in a row to win by a couple of points or something. And I think Joey might have been your manager. He was your coach. Yeah. He came down the line. And he was like a dog. <laughs> And he's like, you got out of jail there. He says, I said, yeah, you got out, though. <laughs> and he was like, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, but hopefully he's forgiving me since. There's probably a bit of a cheeky comment, though. But for um, yeah, that's the, that's the story of the free take But look, it, it didn't do you any harm anyway, I bet. So I suppose uh, you're not too bad, you know. But um, look, I suppose we want to talk a little bit about 2019. And I suppose for Waterford, uh, for those of us looking in, I suppose it's very simple to say, but it was nearly a season that revolved around two different five-minute periods, I suppose, both in County Tipperary. Um, <laughs> for you, um, look, you're, I suppose you're five points up, Donald, in the rag when, uh, when the game was abandoned. Um, and it might, might very well have changed the course of the season for you. Yeah, I suppose, Jeannie, it's... it's um, better be able to tell you even the day. <laughs> This Sunday, she, I say the, the date of that day is in primary um, June 15th was a day that we put an awful amount of effort into as a group in Waterford, uh, to be honest with Adrian. And, and yeah, it was devastating when it happened. But I suppose it didn't just happen on that day. I suppose it was the work that, you it, know, it's probably that, that, that fixture kind of came from 2018 when we'd lost the quarter final to a Tipperary in our park in Keith. So we decided, like, I remember coming back in the bus that night, my attentions completely turned to the previous season, you know, and I knew we were onto something there, and if we could go in and find four or five players, and if we could go to an almighty level to get up to that level. And I suppose 2019 probably started in 2018, Adrian. Uh, brought the girls back very early in um, 2018. We went back in October, and we'd done a pile of uh, ball alley work in the Mount Sign Club. And um, just wanted to get their technique right and bring in girls. And just, I, I, I firmly believe in the ball, Ellie. I think it's the most important place for a, for a hurl or any of And we've done a pile of work up there. And we've done a pile of work in our, on um, tight area games where we didn't want to lose the ball position. I felt as if we were very weak in position. So it was building towards it. And look, we got tip in the first round of the championship. And I suppose, let's be honest about it, we knew it was probably the main game. And when you had... Galway and Kilkenny on the opposite side, you knew they were going to fill one and two in the standings. So you didn't want to be finishing third in your group. Firstly, you wanted to qualify and you cork your group. And I always felt as if that we were up there with any of them if we, if we were right in the day. And um, I suppose the tip game was, it was undoubtedly the work we led into it. So when we played tip in the Munster Championship, we played them in the league. Uh, we weren't too bothered about it. We went up to the right. I was very surprised. They probably told, told us that Tipperary didn't really care about us, Adrian, when um, we drew him in the Munster Championship and they gave us a dry run out in the rag. So we were delighted with that. And, you know, I suppose it was kind of the confidence that comes out of Tipper anyway. But, you know, I suppose the, the effort that the players put into that and the group as management, like, I suppose, to, to give you the detail that we maybe went into, Adrian, was um, our, our analyst, for example, when we played Tipperary in the rag in the Munster Championship. Uh, I was suspended for the game the first time. <laughs> in my life, it was actually been the, there, season. Worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the previous season against It's Park wicked easy to get suspended in, uh, from the Camogie. I've never been suspended from the gym. Oh, stop. Yeah, I've never ah, said that. So sensitive or something. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, played, we played tip in the Munster Championship and I felt as if we were going to go there to learn. You know, we wanted to learn as much as we could because I didn't want to... I wasn't going out preparing a team to lose a championship game, Adrian. I've been over to Watford, our tiny team, for going out losing the game. But it was a game where I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could and get in as much um, feedback and detail. So our analyst, Peter O'Keefe, is going to be the top analyst in the country, by the way. He's with me in Aaron's own. You heard the name first. He's a bit carping at the minute. <laughs> and, and you're using his... Uh, you're using his... <laughs> <laughs> you're using his actually, uh, so he's the computer, Is that an advertising phone number underneath? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but even on that day, like Peter, Peter came up with an idea um, about, you know, would he, um, would he stand behind the Tipperary management? And he went a step farther and even put on a Tipperary jersey. So he would he fit right in. So we, tr- we, we studied the tip management team was coming back with feedback from that. So we knew exactly what tip we're going to be coming with on June 15th. And we've done a massive amount of work and the girls put in a ridiculous amount of effort for that game. And it's supposed to be to try and get our matchups right as much as we could. And to be honest, we were well up on tip that day. We were well up in them and we were all over the pitch. We were, we were well on top. And I suppose after that is pretty much history what happened. And it, it looked, we were absolutely devastated. Came out of and the poor came out of the okay, so That was the main thing. But and, no, we weren't happy. I, I've never, I have to be honest with you, I suppose, with the effort that the girls and the whole management had put in and the whole group collectively put into that day, I suppose. It's only been two times in my life, Adrian, where I've been actually that sick because I was so depressed. And one of them was very personal. Uh, one, and the morning after that game against Tipperary, I just I got sick. I was so devastated for the girls, like the, the effort that they put in. But look, we got the second chance, so we didn't. So we can't complain too much. Yeah, but just going on about the refix game. Um, again, it, like what was the the build or the self belief in the squad? Like it looked like it was it was excellent. But what was the build up like going into that second game? Yeah, um, look, it was. It was definitely a serious game. Um, we were, as I already said, like we were three, we were three points up. I think with three minutes left in normal time for our first time going to ever be Tipperary. So we had um, a game in between, and then that week we just solely concentrated on uh, we Dublin before, so that was a massive one as well. To be fair, we turned it around and we got the win there. But that week it was, it was. It, I suppose it's a hard thing to try not become too fixated on what happened previously. And trying to concentrate on on that game, but girls definitely were. I think both sides can say that they, they were definitely fired up, um, and definitely definitely up for the game. But we just tried to concentrate on ourselves and and getting the win. And unfortunately, it didn't happen that day. We were we definitely could have won it, and I, it's definitely one we regret. And I think Donald certainly agree with me there that we that it, we should have won it nearly. But um, no, look, it was trying to concentrate on on that game and and not getting too fixated on the whole. The whole summer and what happened previously. Yeah, I suppose yeah. Donald, because of that result, then you, you ended up playing Galway, I suppose, instead of playing Limerick, which look no offense to, to Limerick, or that is is a completely different kettle of fish altogether. But geez, like the the way you played for for 35, 40 minutes of that game, like coming third in the group, you know, it, it certainly didn't have any effect on you, like. I suppose, what was the self-belief like in the squad to even go and produce a performance like that as an underdog, first of all? And I suppose if I know you at all, does the five minutes after half time haunt you a little bit? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so, Adrian, there was no point. I've, I've probably watched the game. And I still haven't deleted it from my um, Sky Bill, so I haven't deleted the game, yes. I've probably watched it a hundred times. I can tell you every... And actually, as we're going, probably going back to the freeze, uh, a little bit there, I suppose. One thing that came from that All Ireland quarter final, and something that I would say is that Carrie Dolan and Beck Carton in an All Ireland quarter final in a pressurised game, the game was up to 51 minutes they were level. There wasn't one score of a free missed in that game on a wet night, to know, pass was wet. And that can just tell you the standard of Camogie. Like if you have TJ Reid, Patrick Horgan, Tony Kelly, any of these guys playing All Ireland quarter final, I guarantee you they'll miss at least one or two frees. Um, scored with freeze on the day. So that can just tell you the standard that that game was played at. And um, look, we built the girls up. We weren't afraid. And that's the one thing, I suppose, that we tried to, to build into the girls uh, right from the very start is that no matter who you are, what you are, you know, wearing that lot for jersey, we're going to give it absolutely everything. You're representing more than yourself and your club. You're representing your county and everything. You know? So we wanted to stay. We didn't want, we didn't care who you are. We were going to have a go off you. And maybe that's maybe a little bit of a difference, Adrian, in a sense to your limericks and to your tips, to be honest with you, um, to a certain degree, that the down tools very easy, you know, and that's the one thing with this group in Watford. Uh, they never down tools in any game. And they went right to the wire and that's they, they trained that way and they were very proud. So yes, the five minutes after half time, Adrian, we were five points up. Um, ironically enough, going into the game, I was very, I was very confident that of a big showing. You can never be confident of victory, but you can be confident that there's a big showing. And you know, we had prepared really well for it. 
and we were five points up. And I, I, we probably look. I had to try and be a step ahead of Cahill if I possibly could, because like to me, Galway were the best team in the country, and it proved that they were. Uh, Cahill got that ten percent out of a, a really, really talented team up there. You know, they they don't have many elite players, Adrian. Like David Fodunhu, Ailey Shroyley, and Neve Kenny. They're probably the only three elite players they have in Galway, and. But they have a balance of 12 to 15 girls that are very good. Do you know what? They were such a strong team. And if, if we look at Waterford, we've only two elite players, uh, Beth and Lorraine Bray. But what we have is maybe we, we don't have many very good players, but we've a lot of good players. Um, Cork probably more elite players than anyone. Uh, they have five or six players. But, they, but Galway were the one team that had such a balance. There was no weakness all over the pitch. So we felt as if, look, can we hit them early? And when we came out of the second half, yes, we missed three goal-scoring opportunities. And probably what scalded me a little bit is that the initial plan that we had going into the game was I was I started bet at midfield, and Galway wouldn't have been expecting that. And she was well on top. Like Ravi O'Flynn. What? It's like Ravi O'Flynn. <laughs> Ravi O'Flynn. Yeah. So I'm only telling you to play forward. So yeah. But then we had planned after 10, 12 minutes we were going to move her to centre forward. And in, and and we're bring her back out. So we we didn't want her standing in the one spot, and so we were going to move around. But looking back on it, with the three goal scoring chances that we had at the start of the second half, if one of them had felt better, I'd have absolutely no idea, or I'd have no doubt at all that she would have taken one of them, and it could have put Galway away. I think a goal, as we know, is far more greater than three points from play. A goal seems to sink. The- and look, we said that we were five points up. We keep going the way we were going. We still got the chances, but we didn't take them. But to be fair to Galway, they weathered the storm, Adrian. You know, and they got a bit of luck, and Cahill made one or two adjustments, and they upped their work rate. Uh, a lot of people said that, you know, we kind of finished very tired. But when you go back and you say to people then that you had seven games in eight weeks, you know, so Galway had a lot of, a lot of spare time. They didn't play as many games. We had a lot of close games. And that can be draining. And it kind of just made me caught up with the girls in the last five or ten minutes. But they gave absolutely everything. And very unlucky. And look, Galway went on and they won the other and the rest is history, I suppose. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Uh, as you said, Galway, were, they kind of really finished out the game strong. They were really impressive. But um, they kind of gave credit to Watford after beating Cork in the final then. Is, is that any consolation to you, Brett, or that they give credit for, for winning the Ireland I probably not, but how does that make you feel? Yeah, look, I suppose it, it's, it means you're, you're there, thereabouts. And the, years, the two previous years we played Galway, we got hammers of them, off them up in Galway. And I suppose it was the self-belief that Dunn was after putting into us that we were even, you know, we were competing with them. But you'd get a lot, I know it, it doesn't mean much, but a lot were like, you know, we were very close to Galway, but they went on and on. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean too much when, when you're after getting bet in a quarter final again. Um, it's obviously nice. And talking to even Neve Hanafy, we would I would have played it up in UL. She said one of the things they looked at against the Cork game was the fight that Waterford that we brought um against them, um, which was nice to hear as well, the work rate and the and everything. But at the end of the day you still got bet in a quarter final and, and Godway went on and won it. Mm-hmm. No, there's no, there's no doubt about it. The Waterford game definitely sharpened Galway up. I think I remember looking at stats before that game, before the semi final. Um, I think the previous three or four times that Galway had not topped their group, they got a handy quarter final and then had lost the semi final. I think there's no doubt about it that geez, the war like that was it was a class game as I like draw as an intro sitting up in the sitting up in the press box watching it as a cracking, cracking game. It's no doubt that it definitely uh, didn't do him any harm anyway. It stood him in good stead. But um, I'd, I'd nearly have to argue with you about him not being elite, though. And geez, we played him the start of 2018 in a challenge match in UL. And I think a week after we beat Limerick by 25 points, they beat us by about 17. <laughs> so I don't know, when they, when they get into their stride, they're just a phenomenal outfit. Like we drew with them this year. And like there was no one at the game. I remember Beth Blow in, in yeah. St. Pat's. And it was without doubt the best camogie match I've ever seen. It was war, yeah. like it was phenomenal. And yeah. there was no one at it, cold night blown pats. Like they are they're a serious outfit. Like, you know, it's just you're de- like you're right, I know, you know you can argue what's elite and what's not elite, but 
they're just they're good everywhere. Like they draw, they're very hard to go and target them with a with a weak uh, with a weak spot or anything. They're a top 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 side. But uh, I suppose in 2019, though, like I don't know, like was there a lot of frustration on your side? I suppose draw. I suppose you obviously look the tip incident was out of your control. I suppose obviously the debacle with the Cork game then and. I suppose, you know, maybe being unlucky to lose in the quarter final, did it all kind of build up into a bit of frustration? Did that lead to you leaving the role, or was it always the plan to leave after 2019 anyway? Question. <laughs> um, no, no, look, I had no intentions of leaving Adrian, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I felt as if that we were coming. Um, you know, we were a fantastic side, we were coming through, we were progressing, massive progression. And, I would have said year three would have been a very big year three for Waterford. Um, I felt as if that we had nearly everyone that we, that we could have had to play for Waterford, but there was a couple of more players out there that would have been a look I was going to go after and try and get them into the setup and try and make us that even a bit more stronger and more fresher. Um, for me, yeah, it was, I suppose. There was, there was many reasons why I didn't go back. Um, none of them, I'll be 100% honest with you, have to do with Aaron's own and Cork and being drawn back into Hurling. I suppose, yeah, look, the frustration, Adrian, for me, look, Adrian, you're doing this there and you're, you're involved with Camogie and UL and you've, been, you've won titles with Limerick and you've been involved with teams. And you're only doing this, Adrian, because you know how committed the girls are. Right? You know how talented that girls are. You know, like Beth would tell you, we, would, we went to win to play... Um, a boys team, minor team, and do you know what? They, they couldn't live with us, like, do you know what? They couldn't live with us. And my, my brother would be an unbelievable hurling fan, and he couldn't get over how talented the girls were. And that was the big draw to me, Adrian. I suppose one of the reasons why I stepped away was probably look, I didn't, I want to be 100% honest with you, I didn't see eye to eye with our county board. Um, I know. <laughs> in there as well. <laughs> yeah. you know, we could so, play it in a drinking game here, we could take off all the things. I know, yeah. <laughs> Suspended by Cody Lords. Yeah, I know, yeah, Cheney was look, we didn't see Itai. Um I wanted to go to one way, they wanted to go another way, and look, it didn't work out. Um, and that was that was one of the reasons I suppose. Looking at the Kamogi Association in itself is that what frustrates me so much, Adrian, is that there's as I said, I'd be a big players person and they put in so much hard work and they don't get any of the credit that they deserve. Do you know what I mean? It means so much to them to represent their counties. Like, if you have their 30 girls on a panel, like, they're not getting expenses to travel training, right? So you know in your heart and soul that they're there for one reason. It's because they love the game. They want to be there. They want to represent their families, their clubs, and represent their county. They love the game so much. And what probably... My heart just be broken for them, in a sense, because I look at the Camogie Association... And they just don't do themselves any favours, Adrian. And the sport is going forward so much, do you know what I mean? As the players, they're elite players, as I said. Do you know, there's a lot of elite players. And the, the work that the management teams in every county is putting in, and the players themselves, like, do you know, if I asked the girls to run to the top of the Knock Me Down Mountains, they'd have done it. Do you know, they were so committed, they'd have done anything. But that's what probably one of them... Probably the main reason, along with the and family, I've I've a lot of I've a lot a lot of things going on with work in my family, Adrian. You know, and managing a team, as you know, is different to coaching the team. You know, my wife has always said to me, Donald, when you're at home, you know, when you're not, can you please be here? But when you're a manager, you can, <laughs> your phone is going to ring. You're trying to organise this, you're trying to organise that, and whereas a coach, you just get your session ready and you go out and you train. You come home. You don't have to put up with anything else. I suppose with the Waterford Camogie, there was a lot of stuff that I had to try and get sorted. That and it took away a lot of. Or I would have given it a third year. I would have loved to have given it a third year. And I think that if we had kept everyone together, that we could have had a great. I've no doubt that it would have been a great shot. But I suppose I just would love to see. And I'll always keep a keen interest in Camogie, but I would love to see the Camogie Association go with. The players with the players, the level ones, as I said, don't really do themselves any great favours. You know, I suppose, like, with prime time, for example, on Adrian on the Sunday game, they get shown the games. And, like, I want to see other counties that are playing their games. Inter-county championship in a background background, you see wire, and it just doesn't look the part. They should be playing in the county ground. I don't care what anyone says. 
and like there's just so much controversy kind of surrounding it between referees and things like that and making mistakes and even just before we finished up Adrian it's supposed to around March the 8th I saw the camogie like there was nothing else going on and the scandal Limerick and Tipperary uh, they didn't know the score two days afterwards I mean the score was 12 <laughs> It wasn't as if it was a 232 to 231. <laughs> um, yeah. No, little things like that. You had the scandal last year with Galway, and I think it was Limerick who were playing Wexford, and they, they were playing the club grounds. It could happen anywhere. The water was mm-hmm. contaminated. You know, that was another thing. The game with us against Tipperary on June 15th, um, I mean, it was laughable, really, when you look at the Sunday game and you see um, the referee making an interview with the ambulance in the background. Do you know, I'm just there, come on, lads. It was way away from that. Like, there was no mm-hmm. preparation. It cost a lot for the game. And the day. Look, we're not going to have sorrows on it. But it's just, I would love if the Commodity Association would go with the, the score at the same pace that the current players at Intercounty level are going. Because, mm-hmm. my God, the talent is unbelievable. And they're, they're putting in so much effort. And they're going to really, really, really high levels, Adrian. Mm-hmm. I know, it's, there's no question about it. It's like we've had this conversation before. And, we probably mentioned other podcasts is like, Joe, why is it called women's hurt? And maybe people struggle with the the concept of it. But yeah. like the danger is that the the association aren't keeping up with the level of development that the players are. Like 100%. they can't keep pace. Do you know, like, like we've played games there, Joe, you know, like with like we've had like we played Galway and like that game we played against Galway, not the hard back to it, but like that was the closest thing you'll ever see to a full blown no, I suppose it helped the Damon Feelham's referee and he doesn't really know yeah. the rules. <laughs> So, but, like it was just hell for leather, and there was no one, there was no one, Joe worried about anyone. No one got hurt. It was just phenomenal, and it's like, Joe, it, it was kind of sad in a way. Like we might never see that on a, in a championship stage because it's just the rules don't allow it. You know, it's like if they just yeah. let them hurl, just play hurling, the potential for the game to explode as a spectacle is phenomenal. You know, it's just absolutely phenomenal. But yes. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Although the other than final and semi-finals, I suppose the refs let the game flow, and there, there were there were better spectacles, you know. But let's see, let's bring Eamon in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. We're only messing Eamon. We'll need to pitch again in October. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and that's that's the reason we're doing this uh, women's hurling. Uh, podcast well we're getting the media up to speed as well with, with, with everything as well yeah. it's, we're, we're kind of keeping our end of the bargain yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Keeping exactly. End of the bargain so yeah <laughs> Just that's it yeah. <laughs> and like you know what they, they train like david I'm, I'm sure you're training with um claire like you're training four and five nights a week and the girls were doing that and they put in a phenomenal amount of effort and it's just it's probably the one galling thing for me and it's both adrian it's, it's one of the things that maybe I decided that, look, I need to get away from that because I, I feel if you're, sometimes it's like having a bucket on the Titanic. Do you know that kind of way? You're, just, you're not going to keep out the water. And there's so yeah. much talent. There's so much untalented in Kogi. It is unbelievable. And like you mean to tell me that Bet Carton or Eve Kilkenny or any of these players are not going to get on their, any senior Ireland team in their county club team? Absolutely. Do you know, there's no doubt at all about it. You look at General O'Connor, she's probably been the greatest player in the last 10, 15 years. You need to tell me she wouldn't have been Finn Barcy in the hurling team. Without a shadow of a doubt, she would have. Do you know, they're fantastic players, put in so much effort. And that's probably the real goal for me is that you, that's, there's just, as I say, that word on tap potential there. Mm-hmm. Big time. Um, Beth, I, we, we'll kind of move on from, from that and we'll just talk about uh, your time in, in UL. Um, like you, you spoke at the start of the podcast how, how the elite standard that at the Ashburn is. Um, we talked to Ursula Jacob as well and she kind of paid a lot of credit back to her time playing uh, for WIT and uh, in the Ashburn. Um, you won four Ashburn Cups. Um, but where do they uh, kind of rank in your career so far? Well, they're they're up there at the very very top. Um, I'd have a massive time. I I heard Ursa talk about it last week as well about the Ashburn, and I think it is definitely the next level on to probably on to senior intercounty. You're playing with um the best and against some of the best. Um, and and for example, like with the tip game this year, we we went out against each other last summer and and laid into each other, and then went out. I played with a lot of the girls. 
and um, we were we were able to put on the same jersey rather than going against each other. And I think I genuinely think it's massive. I went into UL and I probably didn't have a great summer the year before, and I think maybe just getting back into playing, you're playing with a whole new team, and and the ball, like say I I was I think it was in the full line the first year, and and the ball coming in and the delivery of the ball and even just playing with girls. Um, from of that of that standard, it can only but stand you. And I think from there, it definitely set me up better to go out and um, with Waterford and and even bring some of that professionalism back to Waterford as well. Big time, big time. I think I'm right in saying that you didn't lose a game in that competition. And uh, no, we, we lost one game in the league, all right. Not in the. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> oh, jeez. I think it's, it's the only game. No, yeah, it's the only game you have lost into records. <laughs> records have been kept. I'd say. Oh, uh, no, to be fair, it's probably the game yeah. that that has nearly helped us to go on and win win the last few. We probably needed that maybe kick just to. Don't give, <laughs> don't give me that credit, please. Uh, there's a long drive home from all, but actually, the, the league cup is up there on the fridge. <laughs> it, it kills me to look at it. WIT written on it from last year. Oh, it's a sicker. It's a killer. But, yeah, it's a fair. Look, I suppose like it's just it, just what you said there about like about the standard. Like it's just you know, everybody thinks it's easy. It's easy. You know, it's, I suppose we've had a few big wins over the years, but like you won a couple of the finals by by a score. You know, we took our eye off the ball once down in WIT and got beaten. You know, it's like it's just the same as any other elite level. You just can't you can't go out with any complacency at all. You have to perform. If you don't, you get beaten, and that's it. You know, it's just yeah, that was. <laughs> It's a different game nearly all together in the winter as well, um, mm. compared to the summer. Like the conditions you play, and we played down in Washford here this year, and um, the condi- I say the game shouldn't have probably went ahead in a way. <laughs> Definitely it's not. Storm and that, but uh, <laughs> no, look, it, it do- it's after meaning an awful lot to me over the last four years. Anyway, and the friends, um, I've got from it definitely would last a lifetime. If we hadn't fluked the goal 13 minutes into the game, we'd have been saying it definitely shouldn't have gone ahead. <laughs> we'd be still giving out about it, probably. It was all part of the plan. All part of the plan. Yeah. But that's the thing, like, you, you went down, back down to Waterford, your own, your own county, um, and the goal, especially in the semi-final, was, was that's what we were saying, just top class. Like, um, what, what was that feeling like going back down to Waterford? Did you have did you have your Watford sport back in that day? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, Anna, to be fair, um, no, it was it was, and it was probably the most nervous I say I've ever been been for a match. I was actually talking to Donald. I think the the Thursday night before the weekend, and and going home to your own home to play uh, matches like that is, is serious. And we were going for the four in a, the five in a row. There's no there's, uh, there was a bit of pressure, I suppose, on in a way, even though we hadn't talked about it once. Um, but it was a sweet one as well, definitely to to captain you well and and to win it down there. And even when it's at home, you get a few club girls. Um, do you know that that the younger girls who probably wouldn't have travelled up up the country for it, but it, but went out the road for it. And it and it wasn't. It was big for the club, I suppose as well. Um, even though they had some playing with WIT as well, but <laughs> it was a nice one as well. Yeah, it's it's, it's just it, it's nearly. I was only just talking about this the other day. We caught and uh, caught. probably like you, Don. She's watched that. She's watched the final like about thirteen times. I suppose. <laughs> Um, she nearly put you under pressure to watch it, but it's it's nearly a shame, Beth. I suppose, like obviously the semi final was a freak. You know, like you know, we were blessed. Like let's call it a spade a spade. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you score that late in the injury time, you know, there's a huge, huge amount of luck involved in it. Um, but it's kind of nearly overshadowed. Like the performance we put in that day in the final. I know what you think about it, but like I didn't have to raise my voice once on the sideline. Like you know, we we talked about the Jacob last weekend that it was massive that Wexford had scored was a three thirteen and the in the 2012 or Ireland final, like we hit 314 on a wet pitch below Waterford, like we cut loose in that final. Yeah. Do you know, everything we'd worked on for six months just came. It was it was a phenomenal performance. It would be a shame if, and look, I suppose it's only natural. Do you know, people talk about that, do you know, that late, late, late goal in the semi final, but like that, like to win an Ashburn final by 11 points, scoring 314 is was one of the all time performances. And I just I think yourself and the team should make sure that you get the credit for that performance. Yeah. You know, yeah. We'll have another cut off it for another few years, but like, just, it would be a shame if the narrative around that weekend was about the semi-final and the, it was almost the perfect performance in the final. You know? Yeah, it definitely was. And we were building. We, we probably played a few challenge games over the winter where in, we were kind of still trying to sort out game plans and, and stuff like that, but it was just the final. It was, it was the most complete performance that team had all year and probably 
maybe in the four years I was there, we just, we really enjoyed it, I suppose, that day as well. When, mm. when you're winning, winning like that, you, you get to enjoy a final more as well. No, definitely, definitely. I suppose, Donald, for yourself, obviously, look, we mentioned you're down Aaron's own in Cork now, and it was a county championship is, uh, is always the goal, I suppose, when you're involved with a club of that size. So what's the, lo- what's the long-term goal for yourself? Do you mention going back into water underage? Do you ever see yourself taking, uh, taking over from Liam Cattle or whoever else is in after him down the line some stage? Mostly a half day in my age, <clears throat> um, there's no doubt at all about it. It's, it's, it would be a dream down the line, but there's, there's, a, there's a time and a place for it, you know. Um, I need to learn how to walk before you can run first and foremost, you know. I suppose I've been around the block with a few teams in my club and lucky enough to win a few titles and things like that. But Aaron's own probably is the first real job where there's probably a little bit of pressure on winning, do you know what I mean? Um, They've got me into to, to try and help them to win a county. Uh, there was no two ways about that, and that's the that's the goal. You know, they're they're building off the back of a team that under twenty one team that won under twenty one title in two thousand and sixteen, and we're also in the senior final that year against the Glen. So they're building off that team, and they feel as if that they've a right chance. And probably that's that's what attracted me to Aaron's own is that going there to win. You know, mm-hmm. there's something in jail. I don't think there's any point in trying to be involved. If you're not going to win, I'd be a bit selfish that way. I want to win. Um, I've no doubt if I had stayed in war for Camogie that the emphasis was always on winning down there and very, very good group of girls. And I do, look, I, I see myself here maybe for a year or two, Adrian. Um, I was going to take a year out this year, but we nearly got it now over the virus, you know, that kind of way. So um, we pretty much have a year out. So it's kind of a shot in the dark this year. We don't know what's happening. And... Next year, hopefully, you'd never know what will happen. And but the Waterford underage probably is look something I'd like to get into the minors or the under twenties. Probably the under twenties more so than anything. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to see can you make a difference to a player at that age because players of 18, 19 years old, it's it's make or break, you know. And if you can give them what you the right guidance going forward. Um, I mean, Dave, you would have looked at the Clare teams that you won a couple under twenty one titles in back to back. And Three actually, we got it wrong on the I got it wrong on the last podcast. I said the only one too. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. three. I stand corrected, David. Yeah. You can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I, I think, I think players, young players, it's if you can give them any bit of a encouragement going forward and try and give them the right information is the most important thing. And solely like it's like yourself there going back to winning in your well, like you know what I mean. The effort you put in, you're the most professional outfit in it by a country mile. And your fingers on the pulse the whole time. And I would have got a phone call off any other manager in UL. And I know we, we'd be on the phone to each other a bit, I know we'd have a bit of crack. You were constantly trying to find an edge with a player, find an outbound player, some own county. And even when you won it this year, you were straight away on it again the year after, asking me about a couple of girls coming through the water. So it's his, his head is going through. We're just going to now. We're just going to flash up to come to UL Law. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it's always good to have a UL plug. You know, it's never been it's easier to podcast. change your CEO choice now with everything that's going on. <laughs> just, uh, just. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, but no, it's 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 about preparation, and that's that's hopefully what you can bring to a team. And look, mm-hmm. to Liam Kyle, he's a temporary man, and he's doing a brilliant job in Watford. He's very passionate, but there's great there's great men in Watford. There's a uh, there's a long line that you'd have to get ahead of first and, and look, I'm 38, I suppose, like a good bit of time before we get to that level. But look, you, then again, you look at Paul Kinnerk, he's won two all Irelands. I think Paul Kinnerk's only 36 as a coach, so... 34. does never... If you're good enough, you're old enough. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, 100%, 100%. And best, just go, like, during the week, I think there was an interview with uh, John Milan and it was, he, was, he kind of talked about the importance and the feeling that he had after winning the county championship with LSL. Um, you've kind of gone close a couple of times. Um, is that, that must be on the priority list now. To, that's your next goal, is it? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely a dream one, all right. Um, I grew up with LSL when they first in 2008. And I, I suppose that even though I was young, it was the club's first then. And it was definitely a massive one. So it's something I've always wanted to do. We came very close there two years ago, all to year about us by a point. And it's any day if anyone asked me what's your, your worst defeat, it would be that day. The feeling for months after that one, that one wasn't great now. And, and last year we got that in the semi um, of the owners' crowd, Cap Quinn. So 
that we've come close and it's always hard. We knew last year it'd be hard because <laughs> getting bet by a point the year before. Do you know, it's always hard to get, to, people think you're just going to nearly, you know, you'll be back then, you give the go again, but it doesn't work like that. So look, this year, I suppose it's wide open now. This year, please God, and, and we'll give it a right go. But it's definitely, definitely a dream in the club is, the club is a big one and it's a tight knit club here. So they're all behind us. So we definitely get treated as one place, I suppose, like you all as well, that um, like we have the same preference of the pitch, the same as the lads and, and stuff like that. So, so we have the support behind us as well. So Eddie, right, we're, 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 on the home, we're on the home stretch, I suppose. So we have a few, uh, a few questions from social media, a few from Instagram and Twitter. Uh, one for you, Beth. Uh, have what for the talent to be September challengers in the near future? Yeah, yeah, look, um, I think so. Anyway, that's a broad enough question there. But um, no, no, look, the, there's work being done underage. And if we can, if the crowd there now can hold on and, and just keep, um, there's a, we have a nice camaraderie there as well. Don't, don't be able to tell you that himself. But um, look, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we're, we're not, we're not like the family either. So it's just, if the work underage can keep happening and we can, we can keep competing at A and, and hold on to what we have. Um, I hope in the near future we can. Um, certainly, I suppose it's what you play for. So <laughs> I hope it can be done anyway. We we got one more question from Twitter, Donald. And um, just how important was it, uh, Bates and Lorraine's also recognition for the future grow growth of uh, Waterford Camogie? Yeah, massive day. It was massive for the girls. Um, I suppose. Bet was always going to be an all star, it was only a matter of when, to be honest with you. Um, you know, she did what I would say a day with a sports to answer that is that looking away from it in my two years there, as I said about elite players, Bet and Lorraine are the two most elite players in Waterford Camogie. They're the best players, they get on any team in the country, they're phenomenal girls. But it was the first time I suppose I would have seen looking back and it and peeling back the skin and you'd say to yourself, right. Why are they all stars? And the one thing that Beth Carton and Lorraine Bray have in common is that hail, rain, or snow, they'll be out training and they go for every ball as if it's, it's, their life depends on it. And that's the difference their preparation, their dedication to the sport. Like Lorraine was, especially, I suppose, it was in my club. Beth, I see the effort that she put in. You know, it was phenomenal. And these girls train, they're not just. Structured trainings, as you know yourself, they have drop in for Clare at a very high level. And if you go to structured training sessions in Clare, if Brian Lowen is he training on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, well, then if you just go to them trainings, you'll never improve the whole time. You need to be putting in the work the Tuesday, the Thursday, the Saturday, maybe take the Sunday off or whatever. And that's the difference between Bet and Lorraine. They're so committed, they want to try and get the best out of themselves. And um, you know, they, that's why they're all stars in their back pocket now. But even Definitely. that story about the freeze, that's only a small little example of the extra bit of training that, that you did and the rewards were, were plentiful after it for you. Yeah, yeah and especially, like, Beth has to be reined in, like, Joe, she'd be ringing me there telling me that she only played 10 minutes for water and she'd be ringing Donald telling him that she only played 10 minutes for you, Alan. <laughs> So we'd be talking to each other the whole time. We don't fool with exactly how long you said. <laughs> so there's a, bit, there's a bit of a rain that needs to be held in there on January or February at times as well. Remember to start to last your Sully, she, she picked up a knock in the game. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember what game it was. And Sully rang me up and he goes, Jesus, going to kill me there. He goes, I bet picked up a bit of a knock there tonight. And he, you're lucky you're at the other end of the phone, you're working beside me. We, we, there both, so bad we both agreed. <laughs> yeah, but, we, we both agreed that look, the, the break would do her no harm because she was in the county final year before the uh, against Scott here. So she'd no real break and she was straight into the to the Ashburn Cup with um, Sully and she'd no real break. So she it was the only time I had a problem with her in Waterford Camogie, right? We decided no, she wasn't playing for. We we're giving her a bit of a break, and we played UCC in a challenge game. Yeah. <laughs> Just puts on bet in the side line when I wouldn't play her in that game. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. I, read this. I still remember yeah. that. <laughs> we we played uh, you know, we played Scotland in a kind of a shinty game on the Saturday after the Ashburn. There was national league to fall on Sunday. I rang every single county manager except Fergal. <laughs> 
As if there's no way he's going to let that play as in focus. I'll apologise after that and ask for permission as it comes to it. Yeah. Uh, you're dealing with a prize asset. Yeah, you have a sensible to, decision. Yeah, sensible decision. But guys, listen, we're going to have to wrap it up or we'll never be able to edit this. So thanks very much for, for coming on. Best of luck to you uh, in whatever guys, I suppose, we all end up out in the field uh, this year. But very best of luck to you. And thanks very much for coming on. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it, guys. Another top class uh, performance again from, from the two, Beth and Donald. Um, really insightful, kind of the way Beth kind of did the extra bit of training and her, her couple of years in, in Ashburn and UL. But who do we have coming up next week, Sully? Yeah, no doubt, Davey. Um, look, Beth, as I said before, I wasn't joking, really. She's definitely the best player I've ever coached, best player in the country. Unbelievable. Donald. Like Donald is 38 years of age, he's, he's one to keep an eye on. You'll remember 10 years' time, you see him on the line to watch for seniors, there's no doubt about it. He, has the, he just has that passion about him, and just, yeah, he's, you can tell by him, he's, he's into it. So, uh, yeah, look, we're lucky, I suppose, next week uh, we have the whole McGrath family from Sarsfields, or however many of them we can fit around, however many <laughs> laptops they have in the house. So, uh, we definitely have Siobhan. Well. Yeah, we definitely have Siobhan, and we definitely have Hopper. So, whoever else we manage to pull in around the kitchen table after that, but. Look, it's sure to be uh, it's sure to be a good one. There'll be no shortage of stories there anyway. So we're looking forward to it. So just as we said before, if you're listening on the podcast, please subscribe um, and give it a like and a comment. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and hit like. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Bye.